So Bill, when you first started out in private practice, did you take insurance? You know, I did, but there are pros and cons about that that I want to talk about. That yeah. I took insurance primarily because once you get what's called credentialed or paneled with an insurance company, you get a lot of referrals directly from that insurance company because all of your clients have this list there on Aetna, for example, and they say, here are the preferred providers in your area. So they will typically call you directly, but it's because they were referred by that insurance company. And if in particular, you're not so good at drawing up business yourself, it's a great way to get started. Good idea. What did you find? Uh, so that's, a, that's a, a good benefit with insurance. What do you find are some cons? The cons are, curiously, um, you're gonna be working harder for less money. In other words, there's a lot of paperwork involved in accepting insurance. And um, you will be paid at a negotiated rate. Uh, the negotiated rate will be probably much less than your full fee. If your full fee, for example, is $150 an hour, you may be getting from the insurance company plus the patient a total of maybe $80, maybe $60. In a really bad case, maybe $50 but you're certainly not going to be getting that full fee and you're by contract not permitted to charge the patient for the deficit. In other words, you negotiate a fee with that insurance company and that's the maximum that you can receive for that service. The rest has to be written off. I found that negotiating a fee with the insurance company isn't that easy when you're a solo provider. And in some parts of the country, they just don't do it at right. all. How do you find out, Bill, how, what insurance companies are paying? You know, it's an interesting thing that it's one of those things that you do a great deal of work and then later you find out. It's like, I'm gonna buy the car and later the guy will tell me how much the car costs. It's a crazy system. Okay. By a contract that many insurance companies insist upon, you're not permitted to talk with your peers about how much they're paying you. So it's difficult information to get but most of them on the sly will tell you uh, kind of in the neighborhood of what to expect. Okay, all right. So, in other words, take a peer out to lunch, maybe ask them what it's like to bill insurance and, and who's, you know, what are the worst parts of it? They might just let it slip out, right? Right, right. <laughs> okay, good deal. Um, so there are some pros of being able to get those referrals. But I've heard that insurance billing is really complicated. Well, it certainly can be. It, it certainly is if you're going to try to uh, do this on your own without any help from software, without help from a billing agent. Many people think, well, that, that kind of justifies uh, hiring a billing agent that's gonna take care of the insurance part of things. But all of a sudden, now your net income is gone down again because the billing agent is gonna charge perhaps 10%. Uh, so here's another hit to that income. The good news is that practice management software like Therapy Appointment makes it pretty easy. You know, we just ask in plain English, here, look on the insurance card, type this information in, type this in, type this in, and all of a sudden, uh, billing insurance for a session becomes as easy as completing your notes and saying, bill the insurance, one keystroke. Uh, so it's kind of crazy these days to try to do and negotiate that system without a practice management system like therapy appointment. Okay. Now, um, did you know that there's a little trick to billing insurance with, uh, with how you bill them that rather than billing the contracted rate, you always bill your usual and typical rate? Right, very good idea because yeah. of, of two reasons. Number one, you never know when they might increase their rates. And if you're billing at this rate, let's say it's $60 and they've increased it to 70, they're not gonna uh, advertise very widely that they've increased their rates and they're gonna be continuing to pay you at that $60 rate. Whereas if you bill at your usual fee of, let's say 150, 
they'll pay 60 when it's 60 and they'll automatically jump up to 70 when it's 70. Yeah. So it's a bit of a game that's played and I just want to assure everyone that your doctors do that. It's not illegal. It's just how the game's played. Right. They're not going to pay you your usual rate. You're not breaking your contract. They're just going to send back uh, in, on the EOB form, the explanation of benefits mm -hmm. form. Uh, yeah, don't forget our negotiated rate. We're going to ask you to write off this amount. And uh, the therapy appointment software does that automatically. Okay. So let's say that I want to bill insurance. I decide I want to get paneled. How do I do that? Not as easy a process as you might think. Um, Many insurance companies say, well, we require this minimum number of years of experience before we'll even consider you to be paneled. So good to know that sort of information before you even try to apply because it's going to be just time wasted if they have a minimum like that. So you'd want to contact that insurance company's provider relations department before you started to look up their minimum requirements. Well put. Well put. Okay. Well, and let me ask you a question. I remember in the old days when I first started out, I had to fill out this very thick packet, sometimes literally 20 or 30 pages of information uh, in order to get paneled with this insurance company. And I would say, well, gee, I guess now that I'm paneled with this one, I can't really ask any other insurance companies. That'd be kind of like a two timing on them. Is it okay to be paneled on more than one company? Absolutely. And I would encourage people to panel on more than one company. First of all, I would really recommend getting to know the major employers in your area and what insurance companies they utilize. Uh, so for example, in my area, the biggest employers are the hospital and the school system. And one is on, on United Healthcare and the other is on Cigna. So I want to make sure that those are two insurance companies that I'm paneled with. Mm -hmm. But um, there's some other ones. Like I'm, I'm not a child therapist. I don't work with children. So it's not going to behoove me to try to get on the STAR or CHIP networks. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's a good conversation to have with maybe a peer is what insurance companies do you panel with and why? Right, right. Right. Who are the, who, where do you get your best source of referrals? And, uh, and maybe they can fill you in on kind of who pays better than others. And now getting on several panels is so much easier than when I first started down in practice because they have this universal form called... Yeah, so there's, a, there's an organization at caqh.org. And so they actually have a credentialing form on their website. So you put all of your information in that. And ideally what happens is insurance companies, when you, when you fill out their paperwork to say, I want a credential and my information's in CAQH, then they'll go and look at all of that in CAQH. So what credentialing really is, is are, they're looking at, are you licensed? Do you have the qualifications to do this job? That's their process of looking at all that. And they want hefty information. There's no doubt about it, but at least you only have to get it once. Right. You may be dealing with getting transcripts from your school. You may be getting letters of recommendation. You may have all sorts of hoops that you have to jump through, yeah. but you only have to do that once. And it becomes as easy then to panel on five insurance companies as it is for one. Yeah. And one really important hoop you need to get to have you know, we didn't mention anywhere else about private practices. You need to get malpractice insurance. Yes. You need that. That's required for you to get credentialed with an insurance company. Good point. That's right. Yeah. And malpractice, it's its a significant hit in terms of income, roughly $8,000 a year. Is that... It depends on your level. Usually for new clinicians, new to private practice, it's pretty low. I think I pay less than $200 a year. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. So. Wow. I was yeah, way off. Absolutely. So. What if I don't want to bill insurance? I don't want to get on a panel. Mm -hmm. Can I bill insurance companies anyway? Yes, there's something called in-network and out-of-network. In-network says, I'm getting referrals from you as an insurance company. The big plus, the only plus, frankly. And out-of-network says, oh, I'm not paneled with you, but the insurance company is going to pay a little bit toward to the patient directly to reimburse them for the services you're providing. Now that's not true of all policies. Uh, in 
some cases they have no out-of-network benefits and so they're going to be just paying you directly but in some cases uh, they have usually a small amount uh, 10 or 20 dollars toward the the fee if you're out of network and you bill it the same way except that you say pay the patient don't pay me because the patient's already paid me at the time of service okay so you're going to collect your full fee from the patient yes and they're submitting this and then it'll just pay the patient if their benefits allow that yes and mind you it's full fee and so that can in some cases be double what you're getting if you were in network okay so makes insurance in network doesn't yeah. sound very good then. so you don't get referrals from them though if you're billing out of network correct uh, it is again the only real plus of uh, being on their panel okay well there's another third party payer we call insurance companies third party payers there's another type of third party payer out there and that's called an employee assistance program yes and and it, as the name implies, employee assistance means it's provided by the employer for a very limited course of psychotherapy, usually three sessions or five sessions, and usually at a slightly reduced rate, uh, sometimes substantially reduced rate from what you would consider your full fee. But the good news is it's 100% from them. The, the patient pays nothing. And... Um, there may be another disadvantage in that they sometimes have bizarre forms that uh, are specific to that particular company, but worth it. What makes it worth it is continuing. So in other words, you might have someone gets three free sessions through their EAP, you can transition into their insurance, or if you don't take insurance, maybe they'll stay on because you developed a good rapport, you made some headway. Right. And easier to get paneled with some EAPs than it is some insurance companies, especially in terms of those years of experience. Sometimes the EAPs are a little bit more lax with that. Okay. And um, those EAP referrals uh, depend heavily on the company. So a good idea to go to the uh, company and talk to the personnel department and get to know them if you want to get that kind of referral. Yeah. All right. So how about getting paid from insurance how does that work well that's the other thing that's really intimidating uh, to people about insurance is um, there's a form called the CMS 1500 and this is a standard form for all health services regulated by the federal government and this form is very dense with information and everything has to be perfect in the right slot and accurate in order for them to um, reimburse you. Here's the little dirty secret. Insurance companies don't want to pay you. <laughs> they will try to find any reason not to pay you because that's how they make their money. Not by paying, but by not paying. And so they, are, they scrutinize these forms. That used to be terrifying to therapists because they would fill out these forms by hand, but they don't have to anymore. How do you do it? Well, therapy appointment <laughs> for one. Uh, any kind of practice management software that's worth its salt is going to fill out these forms for you completely and accurately and submit them electronically so that you don't have to even lick a stamp. Okay, so I know that insurance companies, um, sounds like you can mail them a check or they can mail you a check or they can set up direct deposit mm -hmm. and i just want to let our listeners know that setting up for direct deposit is the only way to do it yes i would not go for the paper check if you have any choice in it whatsoever it's sometimes a little creepy in the beginning because you think gee am i sure i even got this money yes it shows up it shows up in your bank account faster than if it were a paper check they prefer to send it uh electronically yeah so a, a good decision yeah and if you ever decide to move your counseling office to a new location you're not worried about checking running down paper checks that might have still went to your old address exactly or losing them in the mail or them claiming not to have mailed them at all right um so yes, uh, no downside to accepting that. There's another electronic component. You can, you're going to submit these through therapy appointment, let's say, electronically. 
they give some electronic information back and you have the option of accepting uh, what's called an ERA, Electronic Remittance Advisory, rather than the EOB that you may be familiar with yourself. It's a paper form with uh, you know information scattered everywhere. The ERA's therapy appointment can intercept, interpret, and apply to the patient's accounts automatically. Wow. You do nothing. It just happens in the background. And so in terms of keeping up with patient accounting, it's all taken care of automatically by the software. It's really just the way to go. Okay, so that makes it sound almost easy. Yeah. That's simple. <laughs> it's certainly far, far easier than it was when people, it, when I started out in practice, we had a, a secretary literally typing on a typewriter these insurance forms. And uh, that was a... Uh, an awful job. Okay. Well, let's talk about um, patient copays and coinsurance. Yes. That's a little confusing. Two different terms. Both of them mean the client owes something. Right. But what's the difference? I was hoping you would answer that question <laughs> because I've always been confused by that, frankly. Yeah. Well, there's two types of two different types of insurance plans out there, and um, that that patients can buy. And one of them is a copay plan where it's a set copay when they go see their doctor. Let's say it's $25. That's what they're going to pay. There's another plan out there that typically has a deductible, which means the patient has to pay for maybe two, three, four thousand dollars worth of of health care first, be short before insurance is going to cover that. And then the coinsurance comes in. It's a percentage of what the contracted rate is for the services that day. So it's confusing and you have to figure that out. Right. And, and you have to know your contracted rate from insurance companies in order to do it. And a part of the confusion is there is absolutely no way of accurately determining how much of their deductible they have satisfied. The only way you find out is uh, you're expecting a check back and instead you get this letter that says, oh, all of that went to the deductible. Oh, well, where's that client now? Oh, they've moved to Florida. Well, I guess I get zero then. You know how I solved that problem? How do you solve that problem? I solved that problem by requiring each of my clients to put a credit card on file with me and at least pay that first session in credit. After that, if they wanted to pay cash or check, I was okay with that. And then, um, in my informed consent, I have a little statement that says, if you know, if your insurance comes back and you have a copay, coinsurance um, due that's higher than we expected it to be, then I get to charge your I get to charge your credit card for that. That is. And then I don't get stuck holding the bill. Right. Another advantage to therapy appointment or any practice management software is. Back in the days when it was paper, people would wait till, until the end of the month and then submit all of these claims at once in one big fat manila envelope And because that was just the way it was done back then. Then you have four sessions, maybe six, before you find out, oh, well, they're still satisfying a deductible. With therapy appointment, at the end of every session, submit that, and so you find out in a matter of two or three days sometimes that they're not going to pay and you don't get stiffed. Absolutely. So is it possible to start off with insurance and then decide later on, you know, I'd kind of like to get my full fee on a more regular basis. Yeah. Or, or are you stuck for life? Well, no, you can, you can decide to sever your contract with an insurance company at any time. You also can decide to limit the number of patients you take under a particular contract. So, um, but realize that if you decide that you want to limit the number of patients you take under a particular contract, that you can't get some others in and charge them your real rates for that. Right. They, get, they get the option of using their insurance right. benefits. Read the contract carefully. Read the contract because carefully. Sometimes they say you can't do that. I had one contract that said you may not limit. Uh, the a number of patients are, are decide right. well because you know I'm only going to take X Y Z company 
if I don't have enough coming from Aetna because Aetna pays better. And they said, nope, if you have a contract with us, it means you're going to be available. If you see the patient, then you'll be available. Yeah. So, but that's not in every contract, and I, I right. would read the contract carefully. So that's a, that's a very important thing. It is a legal document. It is a legal agreement between you and the insurance company, and they win. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Unfortunately, they are a much bigger fish than you are. So if you make that transition to saying, I'm only going to accept private pay, or maybe a combination of private pay and sliding scale, all of a sudden, all of these referrals coming from the insurance company dry up, dry up overnight. They do. What do you, what do, you do? I would, well, first of all, I would caution anyone would go in that route unless you have been in a community long enough to really build a name for yourself. If you're at the point that you are turning people away, from your practice that you don't have enough room, that's maybe a good time to move into a group practice environment, you know, add, you know, build your practice. But additionally, it may mean that you can get off some of those insurance panels that are real low payers right. and not worry about them any longer. Right. You can cut them off one yeah. at a time, holding on to the high payers until the last moment. That's correct. So, um, but yes, you do need that referral. You need that steady stream of referral sources. And that's a good segue to what our next topic's gonna be. All right. Enhancing your referral sources. See you then. <laughs>